All right, take a quick look at these charts and tell me if there's something apparent, something that just jumps out at you about where the parables are found. Well, Luke has more than the other two combined. There you go. Luke has more than everybody else. What else? What's missing? John. There's no John, right? There, John does not have parables. And John does not have demon uh, exorcisms. Right? So you think about Jesus' ministry and two of the things that jump out at you from Matthew, Mark, and Luke are that he teaches in parables and he casts out demons. John has neither one. So that's just how different John really is. So we won't be in John as we're talking about the parables. Uh, another question is, what do you count as a parable? Some people count anything that is a figure of speech. If you've got a simile or a metaphor, then they count that as a parable. Some only count the stories. You, you need a storyline to make a parable. So there's all kinds of um, takes on it. But uh, we're going to be looking at a little bit of both. There'll be some that we look at that are shorter than others, obviously. Uh, some that are very long and involved and some that are just a few words. But the purpose of a parable seems to have shifted during Jesus' ministry. Early on, and we'll take a look at a couple from the Sermon on the Mount here in a minute, they seem to be fairly simple things that people could pick up on. As we get a little bit farther into the text, he gets frustrated with folks that are not understanding his teaching or not listening to the message he's trying to give them. And he begins to teach in parables that confuse them, things that they don't understand. And for years, I thought parables were supposed to be helpers. Right? They're like sermon illustrations, something that would make the audience more connected to the message. When the disciples asked Jesus why he taught in parables, Jesus said, well, to you it's been given to understand the mysteries of the kingdom, but to everybody else it's not been given. So I teach them in parables so that seeing they will see but not perceive, and hearing they will hear but not understand. It's designed to keep them from truly understanding everything that he was telling the disciples. So we'll, we'll look at an example of that probably uh, next week. Um, one of the charts I looked at had 39 parables altogether uh, and about 37 miracles. So again, when, when you look at Matthew, Mark, and Luke, there's about the same number of parables as there are miracles. So Jesus is teaching in a new, and well, not really necessarily new, but in a different sort of way. And he's doing miracles to back up the message that he's presenting. So these people are getting something very new, very different from Jesus as he's teaching in, in large groups and to a lesser degree even with just the disciples. When he's talking to the disciples, you'll see that he's more specific, a little more easily understood. But when he's speaking to the crowds, then more of the parables uh, show up. Uh, I like to divide the parables into two major categories. There's just general audience parables. Like you've got a crowd of 5,000 people and you're talking about uh, their relationship with God. And so you, you give them just kind of general parables. Some of them understand it, some of them don't. And then some are aimed specifically at the leadership. The the Jewish leadership, especially toward the end of Matthew, they get just bombarded with these parables. And they begin to understand that Jesus is talking about them. So as their anger with Jesus is increasing, their understanding, not necessarily of the parables in general, but their understanding that they're a target in these stories begins to be more parent to them and so that angers them even more and they want to do something about it um, the parables have a little tinge of the Gentiles coming into the kingdom 
So when you're talking about Jesus giving information out that he doesn't necessarily want everybody to understand, talking about bringing Gentiles into the kingdom is that sort of thing. Now, we said that John doesn't have parables, but John has I am statements, which are almost parabolic. I'm the good shepherd. I lay down my life for the sheep. Uh, there are sheep that are not part of this fold. They will hear my voice as well, and they will come, and I will make one big fold. So he's talking about bringing the Gentiles into the kingdom, but he doesn't say, you guys hang around. You're not the only ones that God wants to save. I'm going to bring the Gentiles too. It gives it more of a, a storyline, more of a, a, a mixed, hidden message. Um, how do we know what Jesus wants us to understand in the parables? Sometimes it's very apparent. You just look at it and the context explains it. Uh, like there's a creditor. He has two debtors. Uh, one owes him a great deal of money. One owes him a little bit of money. He forgives both of them everything that they owe him. Which one will love the creditor more. And everybody goes, oh, well, the one that owed him the most money. And Jesus says, well, yeah, that's the way it is with the Heavenly Father. If you've been forgiven a lot, then you love a lot. If you've only been forgiven a little, you only love a little. And there's a little poke at the Pharisees who didn't think they had any sins. And there's a poke at people who were looking down on those around them as not being really holy people. So Jesus is a very quick uh, parable, but it's um, it, it's easily explained. People understood the point of the story. Uh, sometimes Jesus will explain the story. When you get into Matthew 13 and you see the parable of the sower, and then right after that, the parable of the tares, the weeds uh, in the field, both of those, Jesus just comes back and explains to his disciples. So there's no question as to what he actually meant. If you misinterpret the parable of the sower, it's because you didn't read the rest of the chapter. The, the disciples come to him later, and they say, would you please explain to us this parable? And Jesus said, well, sure I will. And he just point by point. This, this represents this, this represents this, this represents this. And it's easy for the disciples to understand. And then they want to know, well, you know, why are you doing the whole parable thing? Jesus says, because I want you to get it, but I don't want everybody else to get it. Uh, you always have to keep in mind the situation and the audience that he's talking to and try to figure out, first of all, is he molding, is he telling them a story that will help them to grow in their faith and to get closer to God, or is it a parable where he's scolding them or he just wants to, you know, put the heat to them because they're not doing what God wants them to. And again, a lot of times the molding parables are given to the general audience and the scolding parables are given to the leadership. They're the ones that need to be kind of have their feet knocked out from under them a little bit. Uh, details are important, but they're not as important as the main storyline. One of those little snippets that some people count as a parable and some people don't. Peter says, how many times should I, a brother sin against me and I forgive him? And what's Jesus' answer? Not seven times, but seven. 70 times seven. Well, there's a, a question in the, the Greek there as to whether he says not seven times, but seven times seven, or whether he says 70 times seven. Does it matter? No. no, that's not the point. Whether it's 50 times or 500 times that you should forgive him, it's a lot. It's more than just, okay, I'm setting a number, and if you do it one more time, we're done. So this ongoing attitude of forgiveness is, uh, is part of the deal. So anyway, as we go through, we'll try to point out and pick out some of those things and pay attention to them. Uh, go over to Matthew 5. Okay, before we get into that, to talk about forgiveness. 
if you don't forgive those who sin against you, what is it that even happens to you? Then the Heavenly Father will not forgive not you. Not forgive you. Absolutely. A lot of people don't understand that. That's true. And, and our culture currently, hatred is not just accepted but applauded. The meaner you can be, the more people uh, will applaud. Now, this one, again, it is fairly simply understood. Uh, when you're preaching on the Sermon on the Mount and you come to these passages, you almost hate to embellish too much. Jesus said what he meant to say. And the congregation understands what Jesus said. It's not a big mystery. But, you know, you've got 25 minutes to fill, so you embellish. You say, try to say something really wise. But you are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. And then the next one on the list is right below it. You're the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand. And it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. So question number one, who is he talking to? <clears throat> Either the apostles or the believers. Right. You've, you've got a crowd of people at the beginning of chapter 5, it says, Jesus saw the crowds. He went up on a mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him, and he began to teach them, meaning the disciples. But there's zero chance in my mind that Jesus and the disciples were alone on the mountain. I think the people saw where Jesus was going, and they followed him. But he's directing it toward disciples, toward believers, and so he says, you, meaning disciples and believers, are the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its saltiness, what's it good for? And so you guys have got to keep being who you've been called to be. It's a simple message, but it's a challenging message. And I think that Peter and James and John and those guys picked up immediately on what Jesus was trying to say. The second one's just like it. Right? You're the light of the world. It's not, you don't have to wonder about the identity of the one he's talking about. Like in the, the parable of the sower, the sower went forth to sow, and some of the seed fell on good ground, and some of it fell on rocky soil. And, you know, who's the sower? When you get into the parable of the tares, the enemy came and sowed weeds among the, the good seed. Well, who's the enemy, right? You, you have to kind of, think it out but when you're sitting in a group with Jesus and Jesus looks at you and says you are the light of the world and then challenges you not to hide the fact that that's who you are so anytime we're reading some at least these parables these metaphors uh, we're reading somebody else's mail he wasn't talking to everybody on the planet when he said this he was talking to the disciples to a small group and telling them what their place was in the world. Now, if I'm preaching this to a congregation of believers, is it right for me to say, you are the salt of the earth? You are the light of the world. Can we make that transition without doing harm to the text? I think so. I mean, we don't have Peter, James, and John in the audience, so there are people who are representative of the kingdom and it's their responsibility, our responsibility. Perhaps it would be better than saying you are the light of the world. It would be more appropriate to say we are the light of the world. Each of us as Christians is the light of the world. Don't put a lamp under a bowl. Uh, there were a couple of things that would happen if you put a lamp under a bowl in those days. Uh, one, you can't see the light. It's not useful. That's Jesus' point. What's the other thing? It would go out. Yeah, We're not talking about a lampshade. We're talking about terracotta pots, right? So you put a terracotta pot over the top of it, 
and not only do you lose the light, you, you lose the flame. It's going to go out. Uh, so his challenge to his disciples is easy to understand, but again, his disciples had to, to learn this way. I'm not sure, other than the stories, we're so used to the parables, how else would Jesus have taught them this truth? Did he talk to them at other times more specifically? We're getting ready to go into this village. And I know that in this village, uh, there's some people that don't believe in me. And I want you to be on your best behavior. I want you, I want you to be lights to these people. I want you to be salt to these people so that, so that we can reach out to them with the gospel. When we uh, used to take our youth group different places, I would always... Uh, tell them I've got three rules. Remember who you are, remember whose you are, and never embarrass me in public. That was, if you could get those three things done, we could have a good trip. Uh, and usually they did pretty well with one and two, and not as well <laughs> with number three. I want to hear why. <laughs> but, you know, your good deeds need to glorify <laughs> your father. So their life had a meaning, and it was a very specific thing that Jesus called on them to be. Uh, now, go over toward the end of the Sermon on the Mount, chapter 7, verse 24. <coughs> this one is not a you are. This one is an everybody, whoever. Uh, therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, the winds blew and beat against the house, yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. And then you notice the, the epilogue here, when Jesus finished saying these things, the crowds were amazed at his teachings because he taught as one who had authority and not like teachers of the law. So at the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount, he took his disciples and they went aside and Jesus began to teach them. When you get to the end of the Sermon on the Mount, all the crowds are amazed at the teachings. So again, he couldn't just take his disciples and, and get away very easily. But how easily can we understand this parable? These folks would not have had any problem picking up on the meaning of this. If you're wise, you'll listen to the things I'm telling you, and you'll build your life on them, and you'll have a firm foundation. If you're foolish, you won't listen to the things that I'm telling you, and your life's going to fall apart. It's simple. Right? And so sometimes the parables are simple enough and direct enough that there's not much difficulty in understanding. And all of the people would have understood exactly what Jesus was talking about in these passages. This is early in his ministry. Again, as time goes by, his rhetoric gets a little more difficult for people to understand. And then finally, he tells his disciples, the reason I'm doing it this way is that I don't want everybody to understand everything that you understand. He's hiding. It's part of that messianic secret that we talk about. Didn't want everybody to know everything too soon. And so he goes through the vast majority of his ministry bringing lots of new believers but not fully sharing himself with the crowds. John does kind of fill in a blank for us there. It says uh, Jesus did not reveal himself to the crowds because he knew what was in man. He didn't need anybody to tell him what people were like. So he just gives out the amount of information he wants people to have and not anymore. So as we look at some more of these parables, we'll, we'll see some that are like that. Questions? Thoughts? Yeah, the scripture says, don't be a hearer of the word, but a, but a doer. A doer. Yeah. So that's, that's why he uh, hears these things of mine and does them not. Built your house on the sand. Yeah. There's down on the coast. 
I got an education. We were looking for a house in Rockport. And you have about three layers of insurance that you have to get on a house. You have to get the certification of where it is in the flood table. And then you have to get insurance for hurricanes and insurance for flooding and then your regular household insurance so that your house payment might not be as much as the insurance payment for the house because you had to have all of these different coverages involved. Well, we had been gone from Rockport for several years before it was ground zero a few years ago for a hurricane that came ashore. I have no idea what it must be like for those folks at this point, what their insurance burden looks like living in a place like that. It's a beautiful place, but when you build your house in Rockport, you're building on sand. Uh, you, have to, you have to make things just right to make them secure. So uh, Jesus says, if you just build it on the sand, you've got a problem when the rains come. Any other call, uh, thoughts, comments? I've always kind of wondered on this, on when it talks about losing its uh, saltiness or losing its taste. Yeah. Sometimes I feel like that's kind of what happens to Christianity nowadays. We, 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 we aim more towards a God loves you, God loves you. We never, we never teach about the sin, the evils of sin anymore because it's just all about all accepting all. I mean, it, to me, that's, that's the message without the salt. You know what I mean? I, I don't know. I know that's not what it's talking about right here, but I've always kind of taken it that way. I agree with you, but the, the metaphor is used by Paul in the opposite direction. Instead of being more direct, more caustic, I'd say, with the message, more hellfire and brimstone, Paul says, uh, let your message, let your teaching be seasoned with salt. And what he means is, tell them what you need to tell them, but try to do it in a way that's not going to be so offensive that they can't swallow it. Give it, you know, give it a little bit of, of uh, you know, that, you know where of that taste. point is. Yeah, where's that point? <laughs> Do what? Oh, know, where's the point? Yeah, where's, where's that the point, point of the where you go over you know, beyond? Because every person's different. That's true. Didn't Paul say he would be all things to all people. To yeah. me, that means that you. You have to tailor your story, your message, to who's listening. As long as the truth remains the truth, the way of communicating the truth is secondary. Uh, you love storytellers. Um, lectures work for some people. Storytelling works for some people. Um, very, very short, pithy Lessons, you know, devotional style lessons work for some people. Uh, lists. I, I knew a guy several years ago who told me, he says, what you need to do is make every sermon, you know, like the top three reasons why Christians need to, you know, whatever. And because people really like, you know, here's number three, here's number two, and now, you know, here's number one reason why he just loved that kind of communication. He could remember that. So, Sometimes, I guess, seasoned with salt does mean how do we communicate to each individual? How do we get to, to what their ability to hear? But, and, and again, not, not all of us can reach all the people. There are certain people in our, in our group, certain people in our uh, society that I can't reach. My personality, my background, my skin color, my uh, culture, whatever, is too different from where they've been. And so for me to communicate with them is very difficult. Somebody else in our group might be very similar to them in background and experiences. And they can share the gospel much more easily than I could. But as we've gotten farther and farther into the 20th, 21st century, we've become more preacher-centric. So we, we say, okay, we hired you, now you you reach out on our behalf. And that's legitimate. That's you know, there's nothing wrong with expecting the preacher to do outreach, 
but the preacher doesn't fit every need, every situation. I think one of the problems of understanding this, it's, it's, it's I guess cultural for lack of better. When we think of salt, what we have, that we shake out, is pure salt. Uh, know anything about market? We have all kinds of good stuff. Celtic salt. And you put Celtic salt in your mouth, and it's salty. But if you keep sucking on it, the salt goes away, and you still got a mouthful of rocks. Okay, because there's all kinds of minerals and all that sort of stuff in there, and that's the kind of salt that they have is that something that you put in your mouth as salt and loses saltiness and you wind up with that salt. Yeah. Because the rocks is what I think of them as. Yeah, that's Jesus' idea. You just throw it out in the road and people walk on it. It just, <laughs> just becomes pavement. Yeah. Absolutely. What else? So some good ideas. I'm actually more, more prone to the lamp under the bowl those guys I, I love electricity when I think about how these people lived because I don't <laughs> like dark uh, dark is not my favorite thing and these folks you know they had little lamps oil lamps and you know, you, I don't care how well you trim your wick and how high you hold your oil lamp it doesn't do you know what we do with electricity where it just fills every corner of the room and you can see everybody and everything within you know the uh, you know ever how many square feet we've got in here but if you're just doing that with a little oil lamp you know that's that's i don't want that place but if you're the only one with a lamp and there's somebody in the dark over there they can find you you know you're the you're the focal point so jesus says if you want to really make a difference get that light up there where people can, can see it have that connection with them. You are the light of the world. Don't hide the light. Let people see. And some of us are a little shy about that because we're afraid we'll make a mistake or some, you know, we'll say, hey, look at me, I'm living the Christian life, and then people will see who we are and be disappointed, and that we'll get in the way of them seeing Jesus rather than bringing them to Jesus. But Jesus says, if if you're enlightened by me, put that light up there where people can see it and it'll make a difference. 